Thank you. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hurt. I am a marine biologist with Captain John Whale Watching and Fishing and also with Sea Salt Charters where I took that lovely picture off of Cape Cod. Um, and I, I basically work as a consultant in policy for conservation, all conservation aspects, but mostly led by whale, that beautiful uh, concept of how the whale can bring us to some conservation changes and education. Um, and I also work as a veterinary technician, so I, I kind of have a few different um, th straws that I have to pull from in terms of uh, what I do for work. So before I move forward, I just want everyone to appreciate this gorgeous view and what you could potentially experience next summer if you decide to come out on a boat with me. Group rates available, just saying. <laughs> um, so this is my office, generally, when I'm not in a veterinary clinic. Um, which is a very nice office to have, and that is the Gulf of Maine. We're up here, sort of on the North Shore and with Boston. This little bowl and hook area, or the flexed arm, is Cape Cod Bay, and that's where I generally work out of. The whales are in this area and down this, the back side of Cape Cod, and I will explain a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, but in any case, this giant body of water here is the Gulf of Maine, and incidentally, as you may have learned in class, it is warming up about eight times faster than pretty much all bodies of water in the whole rest of the entire world. Which means that it makes a pretty amazeballs living laboratory for basically everything from the very tiniest of microorganisms to ocean acidification issues to some of the daily workings of some of our largest creatures, like this one right here. Does anyone know what that is? An alien. What is it? Some of you guys have been on a watch, right? A wildlife cruise before. Do so you guys know what that organism is right there? That's sticking out of the water? I promise it's not the Loch Ness Monster. It is a whale. It is a whale. Thank you. <laughs> it is the face of a baby humpback whale, which my friend Carly Foster took a picture of this past summer. That whale would be about six months old at the time of the taking of that, and it would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15,000 pounds, so pretty small. That was supposed to generate a laugh, no? Okay. In any case, um, so what I wanted to start with before I really started talking about ocean conservation was a little bit about myself, and I absolutely promise that the slides are not going to look like this absolute mess. But what I wanted to give you um, to start out was really just a sense of what it takes to be what you want to be and do what you love. And I'm 31 years old and still not there yet. So for a quick, quick bit, this is essentially my path, which I like to refer to in, as far as career paths go, the spaghetti plate as opposed to the straight and narrow. Say if you wanted to be an accountant, for example, you might go to school, get your accounting degree, and start working for a firm. That's it, right? Well, when it comes to being a scientist, there are so many millions of aspects and denominations and ways that you can go that you actually have to follow what looks a little bit more like a squiggly line. So that usually results in some interesting um, experiences and you learn by meeting people and developing skill sets. And that usually is because you have needed to take a class uh, and you develop something you were interested in because of that class, or you met somebody on a whale watch and decided to go forward with an experience that opened itself up to you. So it's all about opportunity, and these are just a few of mine. I am not at all going to read off of that, but just to give you a sense. So these are some of the pictures from my background before I had a really nice um, digital camera. This is a really old one here from when I went to college in Machias, Maine, one of my first respondings for, for wild animal rehabilitation was a moose stuck in a mud hole, which was an interesting experience in the rain. Um, this here is the notch in the tail of a whale. See, that's the tail of a whale right there. And it is covered in whale lice. That was an interesting response. Up here is the beginnings of the articulation of a skeleton or the putting together of a skeleton of a minke whale. And over here, this is me on the Captain John boat talking to students and teachers about some of the really cool ecology in the Gulf of Maine. 
So that's just a little bit of, of my taste of where things got started with me, which started very young and I really have not really done anything else except for biology things and science things, which makes me kind of geeky, but I like what I do. In any case, um, after schooling and interest in ocean work, I decided to go um, start going on whale watches again. And I was presented with the opportunity to do some surveying for uh, whale watch groups. One of them was Captain John Whale Watching and Fishing, which is in the town of Plymouth, America's hometown. Come by for the parade next weekend if you're around. Uh, and this company's been around for 70 years. They're actually a commercial company, and I never worked with anybody commercial before because everything I had done was really either academic, university level, research group or like a non-profit of some kind. So they hired me as their naturalist and I began to whale watch not through the eyes of a surveyor or, or a passenger but really just for the, for the fun of things. It didn't at all feel like a paycheck. And what I got to see on a daily basis was wildlife encounters up close and personal. And that's when it, I really got fired up about studying whales. This is one of those superstars. There's two different types, two different groupings of whales uh, in the Gulf of Maine, and I'm sure that you know some of them. You've probably seen some of the toothed dolphins or odontocetes that we see, things like orcas, dolphins, porpoises, they all have teeth. Well, some of the larger whales, like we saw in the beginning, uh, they have baleen, which is a filtration structure in their mouth that helps them to gain large amounts of food. And it basically acts like a gigantic push broom. I'm not going to go into the science of that, but if you want to look at a piece, a specimen of, of baleen, or come on a whale watch and hear about that and see it in action, there's really a whole world of interesting things to look at there. So I'll be happy to do that with you if you have other questions. But this really was such an amazing gargantuan creature that I just couldn't stay away from them, so I whale watched more and more. And it got me thinking about what whales mean to the world. You know, you think about what do people do and why do they do it? Um, people love dolphins. Why do they love dolphins? Why do they love fluffy dogs and cats? It's because they're cute, right? Sometimes they personify them in different ways, like through cartoons. Sometimes they anthropomorphize them, as in humanize them, and it makes us feel like we're closer to them. For whales, they have a bit more of a story to tell. Of course they're cute if you like that sort of thing. I don't know if some people think that's cute. I do, all 50 tons of it. But it, it has a role in a larger world. And the reason why I started doing what I was doing in the first place was because I loved the ocean and, and cared about it and wanted to, to make things better. So I found a vehicle to talk to people about that. And that vehicle, that symbol, ended up being whales. And I'm going to tell you my story about how I got to that. But first. Let's address the ocean. Does anybody ever use the ocean to recreate, to go have fun? Any sailors here? Swimmers? Come on, guys, you're coastal. <laughs> Professor doesn't count. We already know. <laughs> and beyond class. You're in a marine biology class, yes? Are you interested in the subject? Is it fun to go swimming in the ocean? It's beautiful to be at, right? It kind of calms you down. Spending time at the beach is a sort of a calming effect. Absolutely. Well, as it turns out, the ocean covers how much of the entire planet, surface area of the planet? More than 75%, right? It's a blue planet, really not a green planet. And as it turns out, the ocean means a lot more than just fun to you or me. And you might not recognize that until you sort of grow up in the big bad world and understand what is happening out there and what we use it for. One of the major ways that we use the world, the world's oceans, is as a food source. And right now, those numbers are 3.5 billion people that eat out of the ocean. And it could be up to 7 billion in the next 20 years or so. So that's a big deal. So just from that alone, there is so much going on when it comes to food production, grabbing the food out of the ocean. What other kinds of things happen in the ocean? How do you get your Game Boys? Are they made down the street from your house? How? I'm not going to call on people. You can just shout it out. From where? Everywhere, right? Everywhere. Um, how about oil and gas? You may have heard of drilling issues. Anyone ever heard of Deepwater Horizon? 
you all might be a little bit young for that. Or way back, the Exxon Valdez. That's a, that's a long time ago. Way back. I'm dating myself. In any case, there's, there's hundreds and thousands of reasons why we use the ocean, but we have to utilize the ocean for, for human care, for, for everything, to make the world go round, essentially. Um, and some of those are listed here. One of the ones that's important to me, not only because I care and really enjoy it and it's fun, but also for my job, is here. Ecotourism. Whale watching. That's the WW. Is $2 billion a year as of an IFAS study from 2009. That was in 2009. And the world is a greener place since then in terms of awareness, thanks to people like Professor Twining and myself. Trips to Costa Rica, Pura Vida, right? And so we're seeing a lot more growth of that as a replacement for things like whale hunting, we whale watch more. So these are all growing industries. Why are they growing? What's happening to the human population? It's increasing. Absolutely. At a small rate or a large one? Right At a large one, which means we're going to use more resources all the time. And some of those resources, like our food, are coming from the ocean. So what impact does that have on the ocean? Do you think it's easy for it to handle? If somebody puts stress on you, do you do a better job in school or at work, or do you do a worse job? <laughs> yeah, what's that next exam going to be like? <laughs> well, what does it do to the ocean? I want to hear from you guys. You're in marine biology class. Teach me something. Tell me what human impact stresses do on the ocean. If we take fish out of the ocean, what happens to the ocean? It certainly can. It certainly can tip it out of balance, right? If we add chemical pollution to the ocean, what does that do to it? Absolutely. There used to be this, this little adage from long ago, um, dilution is the solution to pollution. And that's what was thought until a really famous woman came along named Rachel Carson, which I urge you all at some point in your lifetime to read, read the book Silent Spring. Um, and she kind of changed that with some knowns that she created on a chemical called DDT. Does anyone know what DDT is? A little bit here or there? The essence of the idea is that it's a, it's a chemical pollutant that gets into the environment and works its way through the food chain and has some really terrible effects. One that is well known to the United States is the fact that um, the bald eagle, they need to sit on their nests in order to incubate their eggs. And DDT, or the effects of it, were creating weaker shells that the birds were, were bearing. And then when the animals sat on their eggs, the eggs cracked. So the little baby eaglets, I love that word, eaglets. The eaglets were never born, uh, which really decreased the population of that particular animal. So that's just one effect. And it's not even an ocean effect. It's just one really symbolic one that I think of. So when it comes to human impacts, yes, there are a heck of a lot of them uh, on the ocean. So the reason why I came into the, to the world as a marine biologist wanting to work with and study whales is that whales have a, a story to tell within that whole concept of conservation. Um, and so these here are some of the things that I do in order to push forward that message of conservation using whales as that vehicle. Um, things like educating the public about ocean conservation. Did most of you go to the National Marine Life Center last week? You did? Did you like it there? I was helping to start that program um, quite a long time ago. I was a, a volunteer for them when I was in college. And that big mural in the lecture hall, I painted that. Um, that, was, that place was really, for me, it was a very um, impactful place in my formative years. It was where I learned a lot of my skills and how to be better at what I do and how to love what I love more, which is the ocean. Uh, and it's experiences like that that really bring people into, into a passion that they care about and it makes them want to work for it. Um, so for National Marine Life Center, that was one for me. Um, a lot of what I do as a naturalist on a whale watch boat is actually educating passengers because they're looking at the whales and I'm talking to them about whales. It's very simple. Oh, this is what you see in the water. And people are really excited about that. It's a lot more fun and exciting than it is standing in front of someone who's being video recorded, I promise you. And you should always, if you ever can, take that experience and do it. Um, 
some of the other things I have to, to deal with are, are monitoring and tracking problems that happen in the ocean that have to do with marine mammals, like animals that strand ashore. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. Um, when those animals do strand ashore, sometimes they're not alive, which creates an issue with uh, public health concerns. So if you watch The Walking Dead, you may understand that dead bodies hanging around is probably not a good thing for the health of others, right? Some of you must watch The Walking Dead, I hope. I'm a zombie fanatic myself. Um, and then there's a whole other side um, with emergency management. My master's degree ended up being in, ended up, I did not plan it, ended up being in emergency management, but I directed it towards wildlife management. And here is a listing of a few of the things that I am involved with or hear about or have to monitor for my work. Um, so one of the things that's most important to be a scientist of any kind is to be able to make observations. And based on those observations, you can ask questions. And after collecting some data and thinking about it, sometimes, oh, sometimes, you can actually provide answers. So I, I uh, thought I had sound here, but I don't know if I can, but I just wanted to show you how cute this little Weddell seal is. Can anybody hear that chirping? Probably not. Maybe not. This video was um, taken in NOAA, uh, by NOAA um, Corps. There are some captains up there in the Arctic who are conducting some pretty interesting surveys. And one of the things that they get to do is video wildlife. That is a minke whale up there. So when you're talking about field observations and someone says, well, what did you do today? You can't say, well, I saw a couple of whales and it was really fun. There are literally millions of data points. And the video is just one really cool part of them. I will have, too, today some GIFs to show you so you can get the sense of how whales move, just so you can take a look. When I work as a naturalist, which is as much as I possibly can, our field season is the summertime when the whales come to visit us, I get to see a lot of really neat things when it comes to whales. But all year round in the Gulf of Maine and here in our coastal environment, we have lots and lots of wildlife because the water is just full of it. Have you ever been down to the beach and looked at the color of the water? Is it clear? What color is it? You ever get in a boat and look at the wake behind you that the boat makes when the water is churning through? It's sort of a bright green, right? What do you think that is? Is it pollution? It's plankton. Here in the Gulf of Maine in the northern Atlantic, what we're seeing is a lot of plankton in the water that really kind of mucks things up and clouds it up and makes it almost look like that dirty Boston water because it is so full of life. Literally thousands and thousands of little organisms per each droplet of water. And those are the microscopic planktons that we see. Those are there because the water is colder and that holds more oxygen and a little bit of less salt. When you have a very enormous grocery store at the bottom of your food chain, do the people in your kingdom do pretty well or do they starve to death? It's really simple, right? If you've got a lot of food, you're going to survive. And so because of that, we have an amazing, amazing biodiversity in our area, which is why you should go on a whale watch. However, we have also lots of other things. Can anybody tell me what this fuzzy cell phone picture from, oh, probably six years ago might be? They are, they're harbor seals. And you can tell that because their faces look like little dogs, like cocker spaniels. They're really far away, but they are doing a behavior called hauling out, which is basically dragging themselves onto rocks and airing out to dry in between their swim sessions. Uh, and this is something that you can absolutely see from the beach. And I'm showing these pictures to you specifically because you might not get in a whale watch boat anytime soon, um, mostly because the season for whale watching is over. <laughs> Another picture you might see from the beach, this is again, uh, this is a different seal. Can you see what it's doing there? Looks like it's walking on water, right? It's at low tide and it's sitting on a rock and it's doing what's called the banana pose. So if you ever go to any local beaches, be on the lookout on the horizon. There's a lot more life in the water than you can imagine. Not just under a microscope, but visibly. Megafauna, large animals that you can see probably on a daily basis if you look hard enough. This particular perspective, the larger one, uh, you are only going to get that from on water. But one of the most interesting and easiest ways to do field observations with whales in particular 
is by looking at their blows, also known as, does anyone know what they're usually called when they come out of their head? That air? Guys, do you have food coma right after lunch? <laughs> yeah, don't be asleep. Spouts. You ever heard of a whale spout before? A whale spout in science language or in naturalist language would be considered a blow, and that is because they are literally blowing the air right out of their lungs. Their blow holes are the same as our two nostrils or nares. They just sit on top of the head because it makes a lot more sense by way of evolution. If you don't want to come out of the water too much, you just let the top of your head come out and then you blow the air out. If they tried to breathe underwater, of course, they would drown because they have lungs. So in this inset picture here, um, there's Cape Cod in the background, those beaches. The whales aren't too far away. Can you see this sort of like scuffy looking dotted piece there in the middle? You wouldn't really be able to see too much of that profile if you're far off. But one thing that you would see is this, and that is right there. It's actually a very low blow here. But typically the blows of some of our larger marine mammals like the whales are in the neighborhood of 10 to 30 feet high. And that's because they're so enormous that their lungs can fill with air. And then when that hot, lungy air reaches the oceanic, the cooler temperatures, it sort of becomes this mist. It's not actually a spout, but it is sort of a misty column look to it. And that is a great way to be able to find whales. And I will ask you to do that in the future if you come on a whale watch with me. The first thing I'll ask you to look for are blows. Now there's something else that we also see in the water around here, and that would be sharks. And you may have heard a bit about that in the news. Instead of giving you a real shark picture, I decided to give you um, Dave Granlin's cartoon of what happens on Cape Cod, which is where I'm from. There's been a lot of hullabaloo of uh, sharks mistaking humans for their normal food. Look to the left, human silhouette. Look to the right, seal silhouette. And the glasses wearing <laughs> great white shark, as we are supposed to imagine it is, says, oops, my bad, I confused the two. Need to review my flashcards. There's less of an issue w between sharks and humans than we think. And I know that you heard a lot about that last week. So I'm going to skip the rest, but it's always a nice thing to laugh about. As long as you don't wear glittery silver items and go swimming with seals, you probably should not have any problems being attacked by a shark. But we do see them in our waters here. Um, and this, you may have actually seen this picture last week with Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Um, this is from um, Mass Department of Marine Fisheries. This upper dorsal fin, looking at the shark from the side, is different than the one here. Do you know which is which? There are two types of sharks in this picture. One is, of course, a great white shark. And the other is a completely harmless plankton-eating animal known as the basking shark. Which is which? Basking sharks, in the basking sharks absolutely in the bottom. Do you know how you can tell? Mouth, Mouth is sticking out on this end. See that little nose? And that fin in the back, the caudal fin, that is the tail. And it's also a little bit more rounded over here. You can see with the shark, cue the Jaws music. That is much more of a triangular fin, so it's a little bit easier to tell. And this is something that, again, not too far from shore you may see on Cape Cod. So some of, moving back to the human impact issues, some of the marine wildlife problems that we see in southeastern mass, I've already named a little bit, that extreme pollution issue, things like uh, marine debris with plastics or chemicals. The ocean acidification issue is, of course, a huge one and a political one. And in this particular climb, I will avoid that conversation. But you can maybe start your own with me on Twitter later. Um, there's also the issue of the strandings that I discussed before with the public health issue. There's a big issue with whales because they're so large and they like to swim in the same waters that our ships do that they can get hit by boats. And that's another one I'm going to address with you today. And also entanglements, which can come in any way, shape, or form, through either as bycatch, they're accidentally caught, or through active uh, fishing gear and ghost gear that sits in the water. So I do want to address each of these um, sort of briefly. I think it would be really great for all of you who are involved in marine anything to look up the organization known as IFA, International Fund for Animal Welfare. And they have projects going on all over the world. They're a very effective organization. Here on Cape Cod, or in this general area, I know we're off Cape, is something called the MMRR. That's the Marine Mammal Research and Rescue Unit. And I work with them as a, a trained volunteer to respond to animals that accidentally come up onto shore. 
as I'm sure you can imagine, dolphins do not belong swimming at the beach. They should be in the actual water. So essentially what a stranding means is that uh, one animal comes ashore. If it's a mass stranding, that's defined really by as two or more coming ashore in the same geographic area. So what that means is that maybe 50 pilot whales could come up all at once on the shore and they can't swim anymore and they're stuck there in the sand or in very shallow water and they can't move very far. And uh, sometimes that means that a dolphin or two strands ashore and then a few hours later another dolphin or two strands ashore. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, and some of them haven't been fully addressed. There's a lot of work done by IFA and other groups to, to look at reasons why. Some may be natural causes, like the huge tidal flux that we have. You can see at high tide here, our water level is very high. And when it's low, it goes way out to sea and you see mud flats for a long time. It might be because they're lost or disoriented or they have some kind of injury or sickness. And that is something that sometimes can be proven through autopsies, or as we know them in the animal world, necropsies. It may be because they were recently weaned, like this little bugger here. Does anyone know what that is? Can you see through me? It is, it's a seal. It's a very skinny little weanling who basically just came away from its mom and said, I'm still hungry and I don't want to work for my food, but was essentially totally fine and just relaxing on the shore. Um, and it may be because of human interaction, which was actually also uh, part of the reason why the animal was not going back in the water in this case. He decided to take a rest on a very busy beach. So there's lots of reasons for single strandings. For mass strandings, some of those reasons can be the same. Some may be related to social structure, um, and some may be related to even storm issues if there's a really big storm surge and the animals get disoriented or lost. But that is something that does require response and is something that you can get involved in at your age. I believe if you're all in college, you're all over 18, right? Which means you can at this time in life start thinking about volunteering for organizations whose, whose beliefs you care about and IFA would be one of them. Another is the amazing and long-standing National Marine Life Center, which as I said, was something that I was involved in in some of my formative years. Sea turtles are their main game. Um, they also see seals who get stranded. And so now that I know, I put this picture in actually before I knew you were going to the Marine Life Center, but um, I, I hope it makes it all that much more special. You probably heard a lot about strandings last week. Um, so I'll just suffice to say that the sea turtles are a little bit more portable than the whales are and awfully cute. As I mentioned with the strandings, they can be a really serious issue with public health. On busy beaches, uh, carcasses that aren't going anywhere, does it, can you see all this? There are about two dozen pilot whales there. They're all in excess of 14 feet long and several tons apiece. Not very easy to, um, to move. And that can present a pretty big job when it comes to the point where the animals have already passed. But we can learn a lot of information about these animals, and that's why we do things like autopsies. As a volunteer for IFA, I'm able to work with the necropsy team and try to get a little bit more information about these animals and hopefully be able to help some of the issues that you see, like the fact that animal pathogens, or basically all those little germies, can get involved in not just whatever made the animal sick, but also can affect humans and other wildlife. It really is a, a key factor in being able to know what's going on in the ocean and how we can do something about it, or if there is something that we can do about it. Moving on to the vessel strikes, this is another human impact concern. This is another humpback whale. Um, we're looking at it from behind as it swims away from us. Those are the nostrils right there, and they happen to be in the open position. Can you see that sort of looks like a human nose? Just a little bit, it's just on the top of the head. Does anyone know what these marks here are? Not What's that? Not gills, nope, not gills because these animals all have lungs. They're, I'll tell you this, they're not natural. And I included this particular whale in this photo um, to sort of caption this idea of the vessel strike. This animal was at one point injured. Can you see, if you think about a propeller turning and a whale swimming by it, how it might sort of slice down the back of the whale? That is exactly what happened here. These are propeller marks, which thankfully the whale survived, but I'm sure it wasn't a very nice road. This animal is called Pleats, and I observed it last summer in Stellwagen Bank, which is just north of Cape Cod. 
actually not too far from where you guys are now. And it, Pleats is a younger whale who was hit by a boat at a very young age. Nobody saw it happen. But the idea of the observations, the field observations, seeing this animal in the environment and being able to observe it day after day and then year after year was able to help us track the healing of this animal and know that it actually did survive. So most of the time, whales are identified by their tails, at least the humpback whales are. And I'm going to get into that a little bit shortly. I wanted to point out pleats because pleats is a whale that when I see it in the environment, I say, oh, that's pleats. And you can tell, unfortunately, because of those scars. So the issue with, the, with vessel strikes is one that has been very near and dear to my heart. It's what I did my dissertation to uh, in grad school. And the things that we were looking at is the interaction between whales who seem to love to eat along the shoreline. They also really enjoy getting in the way of boats on accident, not on purpose. This graphic is, I'm sure, very confusing to all of you and looks like a three-year-old went to town with a crayon, right? What it actually is, uh, is a map made by NOAA of the mid-Atlantic waters from several different ports. Um, in this case, we're around between Maryland and Virginia. And all these purple lines denote one path of a shipping vessel of some kind, like a large shipping vessel over 60 feet. And this was produced by, by AIS, which is a way to tell where, where boats go in the water. And so it, it basically creates a map of their path. So this is, all of this was in about one month's period of time. So you can imagine that the, the shores um, and the coastal waters are basically like a superhighway pretty much at all times because of those human impact issues we discussed before. Things like food, shipping, oil and gas um, concerns, things like that. And many of our whales, particularly the, the North Atlantic right whale, and also our humpback whales, do tend to go very close to shore for things like vacationing, right? For, for their food or for their breeding purposes. So you can see this picture here, this inset picture, shows a humpback whale pretty, pretty close to a city. When you think of cities, you don't really think about whales, but that really is a concern, and that's why we sometimes see animals like pleats.